The First World War of 1914-1918 was the bloodiest conflict in Canadian history, taking the lives of nearly 61,000 uh, Canadians. That was a higher percentage of population in the U.S. Um, it erased romantic notions of war, introducing slaughter on a massive scale, and instilled a fear of foreign military involvement that would last until the Second World War. This happened in uh, America as well. Three important um, uh, effects of this war. The great achievements of Canadian soldiers on battlefields in Europe ignited a sense of national pride and a confidence that Canada could stand on its own, apart from the British Empire, on the world stage. Very important. Also, the war deepened the divide between French and English Canada. And finally, it marked the beginning of a widespread state intervention in society and the economy. The Canadian Parliament didn't choose to go to war in 1914. The country's foreign affairs were guided in London. Uh, so when Britain's ultimatum to Germany to withdraw its army from Belgium expired on the 4th of August, 1914, the British Empire, including Canada, was at war, allied with Serbia, Russia, and France against German and Austro-Hungarian empires. The war united Canadians at first. The Liberal opposition, under Sir Wilfrid Laurier, uh, urged Prime Minister Sir Robert Borden's Conservative government to take sweeping powers under the new War Measures Act. Minister of uh, Militia Sam Hughes uh, summoned 25,000 volunteers to train at a new camp uh, at Valcartier near Quebec. Some 33,000 showed up. On October 3rd, um, the first contingent sailed for England. Much of Canada's war effort was launched by volunteers. You may recall that Canada had no standing army. Um, the Canadian uh, Patriotic Fund collected money to support soldiers' families. A military Hospitals Commission cared for the sick and wounded. Churches, charities, women's organizations, and the Red Cross found ways to do their bit for the war effort. In patriotic fervor, Canadians demanded that Germans and Austrians be dismissed from their jobs and interned, put in camps. Uh, only under reasonable suspicion of, of, um, of you know, nefarious activities, but still a lot were in, in ter uh, interned. Um, there was pressure to change the name of Berlin, Ontario, to rename itself Kitchener. Kitchener was a senior British officer uh, who, who would die in the war, actually. So we see some of the same repression and hostility in Canada as in the U.S. Now, uh, recall that uh, Canada was in a recession right before the war. We talked about boom and bust. This was the bust. Uh, and at first, the war hurt, hurt an already troubled economy, increasing unemployment, making it hard for Canada's new debt-ridden transcontinental railways, the, the, the Canadian Northern and the Grand Trunk Pacific, to find credit. By 1915, however, military spending equaled the entire government expenditure of 1913. So that was was a stimulative effect to the, the economy. Uh, Minister of Finance Thomas White opposed raising taxes to fund this. Since Britain could not afford to lend to Canada, White turned to the U.S. Also, despite the belief that Canadians would never lend to their own government, uh, White had to take the risk. So in 1915, he asked for $50 million uh, by selling bonds. He got $100 million. Uh, in 1917, the government's uh, victory loan campaign began raising huge sums from ordinary citizens for the first time, just like in the U.S. Uh, Canada's war effort was financed mainly by such borrowing. Between 1913 and 1918, the national debt rose from $463 million to $2.46 billion. Uh, Canada's economic burden would have been unbearable without huge exports of wheat, timber, and munitions. A pre-war crop failure had been a warning to prairie farmers of future droughts, but a bumper crop in 1915 and soaring prices because of the uh, demand in Europe banished caution. And since many farm laborers had joined the army, farmers began to complain of a labor shortage. It was hoped that factories shut down by the recession would profit from the war. So manufacturers formed a committee. They got contracts to make British artillery ammunition and create a brand new industry. It was not easy. Uh, by the summer of 1915, the committee had orders worth $170 million, but it only delivered $5.5 million in, sh in artillery shells. The British government insisted on reorganization, and the result was the Imperial Munitions Board, which was basically a British agency in Canada, but it was headed uh, by a Canadian, hard, very talented, hard-driving guy, uh, Joseph Flavelle. Uh, 
and he did an effective job reorganizing things. By 1917, he had made the IMB Canada's biggest business with 250,000 workers. And when the British stopped buying in Canada in 1917, Flavel negotiated huge contracts with the Americans. Now, unemployed uh, workers flocked to enlist in 1914-1915. Recruiting, handled by pre-war militia regiments and civic organizations, cost the government nothing. Uh, by the end of 1914, the target for the Canadian Expeditionary Force, the CEF, was 50,000. Uh, by the summer of 1915, it was 150,000. During a visit to England that summer, Prime Minister Robert Borden was shocked with the magnitude of the struggle. Uh, this this total war, the sausage maker, the Western Front was referred to as. To demonstrate Canadian commitment to the war effort, Borden used his 1916 New Year's message to pledge 500,000 soldiers from a Canadian population of barely 8 million. Uh, by then, volunteering had, had virtually run dry. Uh, early contingents uh, had been filled by recent British immigrants. Uh, enlistments in 1915 had taken most of the Canadian-born who were willing to go. The total, 330,000, was impressive but insufficient. Recruiting methods became divisive. Uh, clergy preached Christian duty. Women wore badges proclaiming knit or fight. More and more English Canadians complained that French Canada was not doing its share. This was not surprising. Few French Canadians felt deep loyalty to Britain or to France, who had abandoned them. Those few in Borden's government had won elections in 1911 by opposing imperialism. Uh, Henri Bourassa, you may recall, uh, the very red uh, Quebecois leader and spokesman of the Qu Quebec's nationalist, uh, initially approved of the war, but soon insisted that French Canada's real enemies were not Germans, but English Canadian Anglicizers, the Ontario intriguers or Irish priest, uh, English-speaking priest, uh, who were busy ending the French language education in the English-speaking provinces. This, this still rankled. Um, in Quebec and across Canada, unemployment gave way to higher wages and a manpower shortage, and so th these were good economic reasons to stay home. All right, to discuss the contribution of the CEF, we have to talk a, a little bit about some battle specifics. Um, uh, Canadians in the CEF became part of the British Army. As Minister of Militia, Hughes insisted on choosing the officers and on retaining the Canadian-made Ross rifle. Since the rifle jammed very easily, uh, and since some of Hughes' choices were incompetent cronies, the Canadian military had serious deficiencies, which is a, a polite way of, of putting it, actually. Uh, a recruiting system based on forming hundreds of new battalions meant that most of them arrived in England only to be broken up, leaving a large residue of unhappy senior officers. Hughes believed that Canadians would be natural soldiers. In practice, they had many costly lessons to learn, but they did so with courage and self-sacrifice. At the Second Battle of Ypres, um, April 1915, uh, a raw 1st Canadian Division suffered uh, over 6,000 casualties, and the Princess, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry a further uh, 678. The troops also shed their defective Ross rifles after uh, Ypres. Um, at the St. Eloi Craters in 1916, the 2nd Division suffered a painful setback because its senior commanders failed to locate their men. In June, the 3rd Division was shattered at Mont Sorel, uh, though the position was recovered by the now, now finally, battle-hardened 1st Division. Uh, these early battle tests uh, eliminated inept officers and showed survivors that careful staff work, preparation, and discipline were vital. Canadians were spared the early battles of the Somme in the summer of 1916, though a separate Newfoundland force, uh, the 1st Newfoundland Regiment, was annihilated at beaumont Amel uh, on that disastrous day, the 1st of July. Uh, Newfoundland, by the way, was still a separate dominion. It would not become a Canadian province until later. When Canadians entered the Battle of the Somme on the 30th of August, their experience helped uh, toward limited gains, though at very high cost. By the end of the battle, the Canadian Corps had reached its full strength of four divisions. The embarrassing confusion of Canadian administration in England and Hughes's reluctance to displace his cronies forced Borden's government to establish a separate Ministry of Overseas Military Forces based in London to control the CEF overseas. Uh, 
Um, bereft of much of his power, Hughes resigned in November of 1916. The act creating the new ministry established that the CEF was now a Canadian military organization, though its day-to-day -day relations with the British Army did not change immediately. Uh, two ministers uh, of this organization, Sir George Purley and then Sir Edward Kemp, gradually reformed overseas administration and expanded effective Canadian control over the CEF. So importantly, it was very painful, but the CEF got better and it got more Canadian. Uh, while most Canadians served with Canadian Corps or with a separate Canadian Cavalry Brigade on the Western Front, Canadians could be found almost everywhere in the Allied war effort. Young Canadians had trained, initially at their own expense, to become pilots in the British Flying Services. In 1917, the Royal Flying Corps opened schools in Canada, and by war's end, almost a quarter of the pilots in the RAF were Canadians. Three of them, Major William A. Bishop, Major Raymond Collishaw, and Colonel William Baker, or I'm sorry, William Barker, um, ranked among the top air aces of the war. Uh, an independent Canadian Air Force was authorized in the last months of the war. Important. Canadians also served with the Royal Navy uh, and Canada's own tiny naval service organized a coastal submarine patrol. Thousands of Canadians cut down forests in Scotland and France, built and operated most of the railways behind the British front. Others ran steamers on the Tigris River uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East uh, and um, cared for the wounded at Salonika uh, in Greece and fought the Bolsheviks at Archangel in Baku uh, after the fall of the, the Republican government in, in um, uh, Russia, there was a civil war between the Bolsheviks and the, the white Russians, as they were known, and the Allies uh, assisted on the side of the white Russians to no avail. Canadians helped. We want to turn our attention to two uh, battles that are particularly significant from the Canadian perspective, Vimy and Passchendaele. Uh, British and French strategists uh, uh, wanted diversions from the main uh, effort against the bulk of the German forces on the European Western Front. Uh, and so a battle-hardened Canadian Corps was a major instrument in this war of attrition. Uh, its skill and training were tested on Easter weekend 1917 when all four divisions were sent forward to capture the seemingly impregnable Vimy Ridge. Weeks of rehearsals, stockpiling, and bombardment paid off. In five days, the ridge was taken. The able British commander of the Corps, Lieutenant General Sir Julian Bean, was promoted. His successor was a Canadian, Lieutenant General Sir Arthur Curry, who followed Bing's methods and improved on them. Instead of attacking uh, Lance uh, in the summer of 1917, Curry captured the nearby Hill 70, number 70, and used artillery to destroy wave after wave of German counterattacks. As an increasingly independent subordinate, Curry questioned orders, but he could not refuse them. When ordered to finish the disastrous British offensive at Passchendaele in October 1917, Curry warned it would cost, cost 16,000 of his 120,000 men. He insisted on time to prepare. Um, he didn't really get it, but the Canadian victory uh, on the dismal waterlogged battlefield, uh, it was a victory, a great one for Canada, but it left a, a toll of 15,650 dead and wounded. Eventually, even the, the patriotic leagues had confessed the failure of voluntary recruiting. Uh, business leaders, Protestants, English-speaking Catholics, such as Bishop Michael Fallon, grew critical of French Canada. Uh, faced with uh, growing demand for conscription, conscription uh, the Borden government co compromised in August 1916 with a program at least of national registration of potential troops, conscripts. Um, a prominent Montreal manufacturer, Arthur Mignolt, uh, was put in, put in charge of Quebec recruiting, and for the first time, public funds were provided. But frankly, uh, final attempts to raise a French-Canadian battalion utterly failed in 1917. Um, this wasn't uh, as distressing uh, initially, this, this lack of uh, French um, uh, troops. Until 1917, Borden had had no more news of the war or Allied strategy than he read in the newspapers. Uh, he, he was concerned about British war leadership, but he, de he devoted 1916 to improving Canadian military administration and muni munitions production. Then in December of 1916, uh, David Lloyd George became head of a new British coalition government and it pledged to wholeheartedly to winning the war, kind of a unity government. And faced by suspicious officials in a failing war effort, Lloyd George summoned leaders of all the dominions to London. 
Canada, Newfoundland, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and so forth. Uh, and they would see for themselves that the Allies needed more men. On March 2nd, when Borden and his fellow premiers met, Russia was collapsing, the French army was close to mutiny, and German submarines had almost cut off supplies to Britain. Um, Borden was a leader in establishing a voice for the Dominions in policymaking and in giving a more independent status for them uh, in the post-war world. In other words, you want us to help, we're going to want something for that later. Um, visits to Canadian camps and hospitals also persuaded Borden that the CEF needed more men. The triumph of Emmy Ridge during his visit gave all Canadians pride, but it cost uh, 10,600 casualties, almost 4,000 of them fatal. So Borden returned to Canada committed to conscription, and on 18th of May 1917, he told Canadians on, of his government's new policy. The promise of 1914 promise of an all-volunteer con, uh, contingent had been superseded by events. There would have to be conscription. This conscription uh, crisis was um, intense. Many, many in English-speaking Canada, farmers, trade union leaders, pacifists, opposed conscription, but, but they had few outlets for their views. They weren't united. French Canada's opposition was almost unanimous, however, under Henri Bourassa, who argued that Canada had, had done enough, that Canada's interests were not served by the European conflict, and that men were needed to grow food and make munitions. Borden felt such arguments were cold and materialistic, Canada owed its support to its young soldiers. Um, the Allied struggle against Prussian militarism was a crusade for freedom. It was I idealistic. It's borrowing from Wilson here. So to win conscription, Borden offered Sir Wilfrid Laurier, uh, the head of the Liberals, a coalition. Laurier refused. He was sure that his party could, could now defeat the Conservatives. He also feared that if he joined Borden, Barassa's nationalism would sweep uh, Quebec, you know, that the, 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 the Quebecois would become more radical um, because he would have, they would see him as abandoning them. He kind of misjudged, uh, Loria misjudged his own support. Many English-speaking liberals agreed that the war was a crusade. Uh, there had been a mood for reform, uh, progressive reform and sacrifice that had led many provinces to grant votes to women and to prohibit the sale and use of liquor. It's exactly what we see happening in the U.S., um, and um, so there was, a, there was a crusading mood. And although they disliked the conservatives, many reform-minded liberals like Ontario's Newton Rowell, for example, believed that Borden was in earnest about the war and Laurier was not. Borden also gave himself two political weapons. On September 20th, 1917, he got Parliament to pass some laws giving the vote to all soldiers, including those overseas. He also gave votes to soldiers' wives, mothers, and sisters, as well as to women serving the armed forces. It also took away from Canadians of enemy origin uh, the vote who had become a citizen since 1902. So basically he added votes um, for conscription and removed liberal voters from the list. On October 6, Parliament was dissolved. Five days later, Borden announced a coalition union government pledged to conscription. Uh, an end to political patronage and full women's suffrage. This is what he ran on, and he got it. Uh, Laurier lost. Uh, eight of Canada's nine provinces endorsed the new government. I, I'm sure you can guess which one did not. Laurier um, could dominate Quebec, and many liberals across Canada, however, would not forget their allegiance to, to Laurier, uh, and so this was still very divisive. Uh, Borden and his ministers had to promise many exemptions to make conscription acceptable. Um, on 17th, 17th of December, Unionists won 153 seats to Laurier's 82. But without the soldiers' vote, only 100,000 votes separated the parties. It was still close. Conscription was not applied until the 1st of January, 1918. Uh, and the Military Service Act that did this had so many opportunities for exemption and appeal that of the more than 400,000 men called, 380,500 of them appealed. So the manpower problem continued. Of course, this was late in the war. In March of 1918, disaster fell upon the Allies. Uh, German armies moved from the eastern to the western front after Russia's collapse in 1917, smashed through British lines. The 5th British Army was destroyed. In Canada, there were anti-conscription uh, riots in Quebec on Easter weekend that, that uh, killed four people. Uh, Borden's new government canceled all exemptions uh, that had been made for the conscription. And so many who had voted Unionist in the belief their sons would be exempted felt betrayed. And so the war had entered a, a bitter final phase. And then on the 6th of um, December in 1917, 
the Halifax Explosion killed 1,600 people. It was followed by the worst snowstorm in two years. The Halifax Explosion, uh, not really known about in the U.S., but it was a major event. Two ships, one of which carried munitions, collided in Halifax Harbor, and the result was the largest human-made explosion prior to the detonation of the first atomic bombs in 1945. The northern end of Halifax was, was flattened by the blast and the sub subsequent uh, tsunami. Across Canada, the heavy borrowing of Sir Thomas White, the, the Minister of Finance, finally led to runaway inflation. Uh, workers joined unions, struck for higher wages. Uh, everything was going poorly. Food and fuel controllers now preached conservation, sought increased production, and sent agents to prosecute hoarders. Um, public pressure to conscript wealth, quote-unquote, uh, go conscript some, some of the rich people's money, forced a reluctant white in April 1970 to finally impose a business profits tax and a war income tax. This was Canada's first income tax. Of course, the U.S. had put theirs in in 1916. Um, and, and had raised it heavily to finance the war. An anti-loafing law threatened jail for any man who was not gainfully employed. Uh, federal police forces were ordered to hunt for sedition. Socialist parties and radical unions were banned, just like in the U.S. So were newspapers published in the enemy, quote-unquote, languages. Canadians learned to live with unprecedented government controls and involvement in their daily lives. Food and fuel shortages led to meatless Fridays and fuelless Saturdays. In other warring countries, exhaustion and despair even went far deeper. Defeat now faced the Western Allies, but the Canadian Corps escaped the succession of uh, German offensives. Sir Arthur Currie insisted that he be kept that, that, that the Canadian Corps be kept together. A fifth Canadian division, held in England since 1916, was finally broken up to provide reinforcements. The U.S. entered the war in the spring of 1917, sending reinforcements and supplies that would eventually turn the tide against Germany. To help restore the Allied line, Canadians and Australians attacked near the French town of Amiens uh, on, on 8th of August 1918. They used shock tactics, airplanes, tanks, infantry, and shattered the German line. In September and early October, the Canadians attacked again and again, suffering heavy casualties but making uh, advances previously thought unimaginable. The Germans fought to, to Mont, a little Belgian town where fighting ended, for the Canadians at 11 a.m. Greenwich time, the 11th of November, 1918, Armistice Day. Canada alone lost 61,000 war dead. Uh, many more returned from the conflict mutilated in mind or body. Survivors found almost every facet of Canadian life uh, different, from the length of skirts to the value of money. Uh, they had been transformed. Governments had assumed responsibilities they would never abandon. The income tax would survive the war. So would government departments, later to become the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Pensions and National Health. Overseas, Canada's soldiers had struggled to achieve and had won a considerable degree of autonomy from British control. Canada's direct reward for her sacrifices was a modest presence at the Versailles Conference and a seat at the new League of Nations. However, Deep national divisions between French and English uh, created by the war and especially by the conscription crisis of 1917 made post-war Canada fearful of international responsibilities. Canadians had done great things in the war, but they had not done them together. <laughs>